Today, I'm going to talk about how after five years, I finally broke three hours in the marathon. Happened in Chicago Marathon 2022. I have a lot of notes, so sorry if this is super long. If you're interested in videos like this, like, like I am, hopefully you'll stick around and hear just all the nuances of the race, how I got under the three hour mark. <laughs> Good, let's just zoom in on my face now. How's that? <laughs> Now, if you're watching this and you saw my Chicago Marathon video, thank you so much for the support there. Got a lot of new subscribers from that. Really exciting. I plan on making a lot more content this fall through the New York City Marathon and into all of my races into 2023. Today, I wanted to talk about what I've gotten in years past in marathons, timing-wise. I ran my first one in 2017 and I got around a 350. Then the next year, uh, I'm a wedding photographer, so I made the mistake of booking a wedding the day before the race in 2018 and then just totally bonked super hard with a 359. Um, and then I got serious in 2019, hired a friend to coach me, really understood what it was like to do a real marathon training block, and I pulled out a 310.55 at Chicago. I puked at mile 15 and then just suffered through the second half, having run, I think, a 130 half split that year. Uh, in 2020, everything was canceled, so I did the New York City virtual marathon. It was the most I've ever run in a year, probably the best shape at that point, heading into a marathon. Got a 305.23, had trouble with, with salt intake, cramping at mile 21, and just kind of falling apart without nutrition. Plus, it was super cold that day. I made a video if you're interested in watching it. I'll link it here. Um, but yeah, 305.23, and that was my PR for two years. 2021 was super hard. I dealt with uh, tendonitis in my ankle and had to go to PT and it just kind of ruined my year with running. Still was able to run New York City in the fall and did a 311. And then I ran Grandma's Marathon back in June alongside Kofuzi and sadly fell apart at 20 and a half, puking again. Got a 303.53 and then finally did this 257.08 in Chicago. So uh, I stacked two training blocks this year. Um, I did you know March through May into June for Grandma's Marathon and I was very fit then. I realized my issue was nutrition. So then the second training block this year was July through October and I had uh, my buddy, my new coach, Brandon, uh, coaching me throughout and putting me through a decent amount of speed work as, as well as hitting volume up to 45 to 55 miles a week. So in this video, I wanna walk you through Marathon Weekend, Friday through Sunday and race day, all of everything that happened um, the week before, the Monday before, I went through one of my final track workouts. I was supposed to do 100 meter strides and I was an idiot and did 100 meter sprints. For some reason, I read sprints in my coach's text to me and I was sore all week <laughs> leading up to the marathon, which is, Obviously very counterintuitive when you want to be tapering. Um, so that was really dumb. But I also ran into Matthew Centrowitz. Good, Centrowitz? Oh, yeah. oh, no way. How's it going, man? Good, how you doing? Olympian. That's an Olympian right there. Olympic gold 1500 meter. Olympic 1500 meter gold medalist at the track is kind of insane. Then I just took it easy the rest of the week. Theragunned a lot chilled, foam rolled. I started carb loading really early. I was watching a lot of marathon videos and people recommending three, four days out, start carb loading. So I was eating a ton of bagels, English muffins. I was doing pasta at night. I was just putting the carbs in my body three days out and really taking care of hydration. So lots of water and drinking, a stick of liquid IV every day, the whole week leading up to marathon. A lot of the training block I was doing is one stick a day just to supplement with hydration. On Friday, we went to the expo. Uh, two days early, I wanted to catch it earlier on instead of going the day before, just so I could skip on all the chaos of what it would be like on a Saturday. And so we went on Friday, it was super awesome. Had this awkward interaction with my coworker from college. <laughs> all right, later. I cannot, for the life of me, remember. I couldn't remember who she was, and I was like socially panicking talking to her. She killed it. She got a 258 uh, at Chicago, which is so sick. Obviously got my bib, got my bag, uh, got my photo, got this goofy footage. It was raining that day, but then the sun came out and the city looked immaculate. And everyone's like taking photos out the window. It was really cool to like start getting the hype going because the fall colors are there. Everybody knew that the weather was gonna be awesome for this race, so you could just feel it at the expo that everyone was just super excited. That night, I made sure to get a full eight hours of sleep because everything I've heard, everything I've studied is that your night before the night before is the most important time for sleep. So I made sure to get an entire eight hour 
full night of rest and I felt really rested. So going into Saturday, I continued to carbo load with uh, sourdough English muffins, bananas, noodles. I did sourdough toast and a bunch of blueberries. Just chilled. Thank you to my wife. We have four kids, so she was super gracious to me and letting me have that time. I just watched marathon vlogs for a lot of the day to get myself hyped, last minute tips and tricks, all that good stuff. YouTube's a wonderful place. And I did a three and a half mile shakeout run where I tested out the camera I was gonna bring on the race course, the Insta360 GO 2. This tiny little action camera that pops out of this thing and I was just carrying this thing by itself. It's one ounce and it was in my back pocket. Well, I'll get to, but it caused me some issues. But really thankful that I got footage on the race course. So I laid out the kit that evening, made sure I had everything all set to go. I had all of the pieces of gear. I had a note in my phone of all the things I needed for race day just to make sure everything the day before was all in place and I was ready to go, not missing anything come race morning. I didn't make too many mistakes on this marathon, but one thing I did make a mistake on was not putting that kit on uh, on Saturday because I woke up and put it on on Sunday morning before the race and my bib just felt off and I had to readjust it and I just felt like I was losing a lot of time. Kind of feeling panicked, like having to adjust that that morning. So lay out all your clothes, but also put them on and see how everything feels before the race the day before. So I ate dinner from 6.30 to eight, really kind of spread it out like a whole hour and a half. But I did three bowls of noodles with red sauce and spinach and chicken. And then I did some sweet potatoes on the side as well. So just tons and tons of carbs, just loading it in. This is something different than I did in years past. Just really, really loading in the carbs because something I learned in this training block listening to uh, a race like no other uh, the New York City Marathon book really understanding that your body can only take in 2,000 calories and hold 2,000 calories at a time so carbo loading before the race is extremely important to try to top off all of that glycogen in your body the carbs converting to glycogen at least from what I know I think that's what it is and then topping it off again in the morning so yeah I fell asleep around 9 p.m. and then woke up at 3 30 a.m. race day and the reason I woke up at 3 30 was because I I was gonna drive myself downtown. I live in the suburbs, it's about a 30 minute drive to get downtown. So I wanted to give myself just a ton of time in the morning to just relax and chill and get all the stuff in my body that I needed to get in my body, which was two sourdough English muffins with peanut butter, banana honey, and sea salt. And then I had a full 16 ounce bottle. The 20 ounce, but I fill it about like three quarters and another liquid IV, full liquid IV. And I did two liquid IVs the day before just to top off on all of the hydration, all the electrolytes. And then I drove myself downtown uh, and I got a spot, hero spot for 20 bucks in a garage that was like three or four blocks from my gate, which was so clutch. I was able to warm up in the garage and then leave my balancing disc and my Theragun in my car, which was so clutch. Then I also brought a 20 ounce water bottle to ditch pre-race, just a plastic water bottle. I definitely drank too much water too close to the race. I felt like I had to pee the first half, which was dumb. So yeah, you gotta figure out that balance when to stop drinking water. I got to my gate at 540. I used the toilet uh, for the second time after using it at home, but really just took my time and making sure to get everything out. Uh, waited at Buckingham Fountain right by the bag drop for about 30 minutes just soaking in the city and that was one of the coolest experiences of the whole race. I'm from Chicago, I just have deep roots in the city so just being able to sit there and look at the skyline before the race was really, really sweet. Uh, so I dropped, dropped my bag, went to the toilet again, uh, emptied the tank, liquids, hung out in the street outside my corral entrance, just kind of soaking it in, taking more footage. And then I entered the AB corral at about 6.40, I believe, um, about 50 minutes before uh, the gun. Went to the toilet one more time, and I hung around my corral, ran into my buddy Brad, who I ran into and met at Grandma's Marathon, and his buddy Chris, around 7 a.m. Oh, I met Brad. I met him at Grandma's. He's a little bit faster than me. I don't think we're going to be in the race together, but we'll at least start together. 255. Can you do it? Come on, got this. Brad was trying to go 255 that day, and Chris was trying to go sub three like me. And then finally, I peed on a tree about 10 minutes before <laughs> my corral closed just trying to empty the tank as much as I could because like I said I was drinking too much water before the race so I entered the B corral around 715 um, 720 is when they close it and it's a hard close and they send you the back of the corral if you don't get in on time so if you're running Chicago make sure you get in that corral because sometimes it bottlenecks and you might be set to go in, but as soon as it hits 720, they just lock everyone out. So make sure you get in on time. So my race strategy, pacing, I wanted to do 650 per mile for the whole first half all the way through the halfway point. And uh, I, was, I was committed to that. Brad and Chris were interested in going a little bit faster than that, and they were encouraging me to maybe come with them. And I was like, I can't, I need to stick to my plan. I'm gonna go 650 the entire first half. I really committed to changing my energy this race. Every marathon I've run up to this point, it's been like so serious, so focused, and just trying to get that sub three mark. And 
I was just learning from people like uh, Seth James Damore, my buddy Craig the Runner on Instagram, uh, Nick Bester, somebody I've just started following, and uh, Ben Johnson, who paced Kofuzi at Grandma's Marathon with me. Just all like smiling and waving to the crowd and interacting with the crowd throughout the race. I was like, you know what, I wanna try that. I think that'll be so much more fun, such a fun experience to do it that way. So I committed to that this race. I changed my nutrition. Uh, I finally started taking gels. Everything before I was, I was really having a hard time taking gels in years past with it upsetting my stomach. So I was doing honey stinger chews, which I ended up finding out it was just not enough calories to supplement because in that same book, A Race Like No Other, they talk about how you lose 100 calories every single mile you run. And so if you only have 2,000, you fall apart at around 20 or just before 20, the classic wall. I found out this year that spring energy is my go-to. This is like an all natural gel and a bunch of different flavors, but I really, in my training, honed in on the apple, apple cinnamon pie, the canaberry, and then the speed nut, which is 250 calories with caffeine, um, whereas these are 180 and 100. But I would just alternate these and I brought six of them on the course. So I started um, with the apple, switched to the caffeine, went to the strawberry smoothie and then just cycle through again in that order um, switching it up the second half strawberry speed nut and then apple at the end and then I uh, also made sure to have salt tabs on the course these are just salt capsules and I took five or six throughout the race to avoid cramping um, something I didn't notice or, or know about early in my training uh, in marathon running and um, this really helps you with making sure you don't cramp and balancing out your hydration of equal amount of water and salt in your body so I took five throughout the course intermitt intermittently between gels or right before a gel or right before an, a water station I also took Gatorade on the course and I, and I trained with lemon lime Gatorade because I knew that was going to be on Chicago's course so my body was extremely familiar with it and I didn't think much of that in training, but once I took that first drink of Gatorade on the course, I, like my mind, it felt like it unlocked something. I was just like, this is so familiar to me. It just feels like a long run right now because I spent two months drinking it in my long runs. So that was really, really helpful for me. And plus it really helped with uh, electrolyte supplementation and sugar supplementation. I feel like my blood sugar was an issue in races past and why I was throwing up a lot as well. I ran the race in the Saucony Endorphin Pro 3. This is my favorite shoe I've ever owned and ever raced in. Um, the combination of, of squish and the foam and the, the return of energy from the carbon fiber plate is just insane. I absolutely love the shoe. So comfortable for me. The toe box is wide enough. That's a problem for me in shoes of the past. Nike racers uh, jam my toes a lot. So this is just excellent for me. I'm gonna try to do a condensed version of my race story and what happened mile by mile. We were in the corral, I was with Brad and Chris and everything was just super high energy. We, we felt so, so excited to race Chicago with the weather that we had. And uh, gun goes off, I crossed the start line about six minutes after gun time where the elites left um, and I just tried to dial it back as best I could and I went through mile one and about 7.05 to 7.10 and when I went to lap my watch, uh, I turned off auto lap because the GPS in Chicago notoriously gets all messed up. So turning off auto lap, I went to lap my watch and then realized a quarter mile later that I actually stopped my workout, which really messed with my head. I started the workout again, but realized now I'm a quarter mile off on my distance and my time on my watch. So now I have to start doing math in my head, all the while trying to not run too fast, not keep up with the three hour pace group or the people trying to run under three hours around me, but really dialing it back to try to get like a 129.30 or a 129.45 half split. So I got through mile two and I found my buddy Shua. All right, Eric just passed me. Who was filming me and completely missed the mile two mark and didn't lap it. And then through mile three, I was filming myself at the Insta360 and missed my lap again. I didn't get a solid manual lap until mile five. So in that meantime, I was kind of freaking out. Like I had no idea what pace I was running. I had no idea where the three hour pace group was. I didn't know if they were ahead of me or behind me. Uh, I didn't see where they were at the start. I knew they were in front of me um, in the corral, but I didn't know if I had passed them. I just committed to running a little bit slower than everybody else around me because I remember I knew that everyone around me was trying to go sub three or around the three hour mark. And I figured that could at least be a gauge to get me at the halfway point at about 1.30 knowing that people tend to go a little bit faster in the first half, stereotypically. So I finally got my first manual split on mile five, and I think it was a 6.55, so I knew I was in the ballpark. I took my first gel at mile four, 
and just kept going, saw my family at mile six, saw my buddy Dan at mile seven, and I started manually lapping those miles, getting 645s, 648, 652. So I was back in my strategy, and I felt like I was clipping off miles right around that 650 mark, and I felt really, really good. Once I looped that top loop on the north side in mile eight, still feeling great, all the way down to nine and 10 where I saw my family again. I saw my buddy Dan again, who got a clip of me. I saw my buddy Andrew who photographed me. And um, I took a gel at mile eight and I was skipping aid stations. I was doing water and then I'd skip an aid station. Then I'd do Gatorade, skip an aid station. And that was something else I realized in years past. I was drinking probably too much water throughout the course. So I committed to not drinking as much, especially since I felt the urge to pee very badly. Um, and that was a whole struggle for me, the first half of feeling like, do I just stop and empty the tank and that'll just make me feel better the rest of the race? And thankfully I decided not to and it went away around that mile 10 mark. And that's where I filmed myself giving an update on how I felt. I felt really, really good. I was really excited having fun, waving, smiling, um, taking in the crowds and right after mile 10 going to mile 11, I dropped my camera and had to backpedal, grab it and pick it up. So. At that point, I was like, I'm just gonna shove this camera back in my pocket and not record until the halfway point because it's too much of a distraction right now. So much so that I completely missed the mile 11 mark. And then I did a two mile lap there where when I approached mile 12, I thought it was mile 11, which psychologically made me feel really good because like, oh, okay, I guess I'm at mile 12 now. Um, saw my buddy Steven, his wife Laura, dropped my gloves off to them and then went around to Wacker where it was about the 13 mile mark where Shua got footage of me and I filmed the crowds, getting them all pumped up, getting everybody around me pumped up, hopefully um, just having fun. Around that point, I was doing enough manual laps where I felt like I was solid, that I was right around 129 and some change. Based on my calculations of the clock on the course and my watch, I knew I was somewhere in 129 something and I ended up being 129.08, which was perfect. Maybe a little bit faster than I wanted, but still really great and still gave me a, a bunch of room to negative split the second half. Because the goal that I uh, made with my coach Brandon was that I would do those 650s um, all the way through the first half and then uh, second half I would start getting down 645s, see how I felt at mile 20 and then start opening up the floodgates and putting my, my foot on the gas. So I got to mile 14 and that's when I caught up with the three hour pacing group. And I honestly hate running with a three hour pace group. It just is always so crowded in major marathons. I've now run Chicago four times. I've run New York once. And I've been in that three hour group every single time I've run it. And it just gives me so much anxiety. All the footsteps, that noise, people shouting paces. I know for some people it feels encouraging, but for me it just feels stressful and I feel anxious. Because I also feel like I'm always trying to catch up with people in the group. So I committed to the left side of the street right after mile 14 where it was a bit thinner and I just kind of worked my way through the three hour crowd of runners, kind of skipping in between each one left and right and zigzagging my way to the front of the pack. Once I got to the front of the pack, I was just like, I just need to put my foot on the gas for a while so I don't hear them anymore. I get ahead of them and then start feeling comfortable again at about 645. So in those miles, 14 to 16, I was running like 640s. And I still felt great. Shua found me at mile 15 and a half, interviewed me a little bit, and I was like, I feel really, really good. I've never felt this good in Chicago before. And I got to mile 16, there was a sound system and people bumping music and I was partying and just having a blast. And I got through mile 17, going south through UIC's campus. Notoriously have just felt awful in this section in years past and I was feeling great. So I got all the way through Little Italy, mile 18. Now I'm starting to feel like I'm, I'm actually overtaking people. People are starting to feel like they're going slower than I am and I'm starting to feel the effects of a negative split and overtaking and passing people. Doing my manual laps and seeing 645, 642, even down to the high 630s, just feeling really, really good and just hoping that I can continue to maintain this. Still taking a gel every four miles, alternating again water and Gatorade and taking my salt tablets throughout. I got to mile 19 and right around mile 19, I really noticed people were really starting to struggle as I have definitely in years past approaching mile 20. Still feeling great overtaking people. That really gave me the psychological and mental confidence to keep pushing at this pace. Got to Pilsen at 18th Street, which in Chicago is just a party. And I was giving it back to the crowd and I, it felt like 18th Street happened in a, just a blur. I ran into Brad, he was having a hard time. Um, I asked him if he was doing all right and he said he wasn't really having a good day. He ended up finishing 303. I got to mile 20, 
and took another speed nut gel with caffeine and that's when nausea completely hit me. As soon as I put it in my mouth, like it came up and I forced it down and I made sure to not let it come up. I was like, I need these calories for the last six miles. This might be the last gel I take. I want this boost of caffeine just don't throw up. So for a quarter mile, I was just fighting throwing up <laughs> and I just forced it down. I made sure I didn't throw up and then I felt fine along the turn going back to Canal Port over uh, Pilsen approaching Chinatown over by Lacuna Lofts. And I ran into my new buddy, Kevin, who photographed me on that corner, which was just so fun to see. He was super encouraging. He said it looked great. And that's when I told him, that was the first person I told and really thought like, I'm gonna do it today. I'm finally gonna go sub three. And that was right after 20 mile mark, approaching 21. Shua caught up with me again as we went on those overpasses approaching Chinatown. Felt incredible, and you can see in the footage I was overtaking people slowly but surely throughout that section as well. Heard my family through Chinatown, didn't see them, but heard them. There's so many people. And then saw Henry Wu, my buddy, um, who's a filmmaker, who, uh, who got a clip of me as well. All the way up until that point, I still just felt great, which I've just never felt that way through this point in a marathon ever. Um, which is obviously a testament to the training and the stacking two blocks that I did this year and all the intentionality that I had with my race plan this year. So I got past mile 22 um, over on the south side, working my way back to Michigan Avenue. And that was the first time I really felt like this was, okay, this is laborious now. Like I'm actually working hard. I saw a dude laid out on the road, felt awful that he was just dealing with a bad, bad cramp. And this is the part of the marathon where it feels like a war zone. And I turned onto Michigan Avenue going south and I was like, I'm still overtaking people. I'm still hitting 640 to 645 splits. Just maintain this and, and see what you can do in the last three to four miles. I passed mile 23 and I was like, okay, I'm gonna try to do one last gel, um, the apple uh, cinnamon flavor one, which is usually the one that goes down easiest for me that I noticed in my training. Right after mile 23, right before the aid station, I grabbed a Gatorade, I grabbed the gel, I put the gel in my mouth and immediately threw up. Like I didn't even have the choice to hold it down. It just came out. And I threw up right in between two volunteers. I felt so bad. So I like heaved six or seven times off to the side of the road while maintaining pace. And I just kept the pace. And I was like, I don't know if this is gonna wreck me or not, but I'm gonna keep running this pace and see how I feel. So as I rounded 35th Street back onto Indiana going north, I still just felt fine. And I was like, all right, well, I'm gonna stick on this blue line. I'm gonna zone the heck out. And I'm just going to focus on my form and driving my arms and legs and just carry it to the finish. Past mile 24 and it felt like after I got past that split, this is in the bag. Like all I have to do is just maintain and I can maybe even go a little bit faster and that's where Shua picked up, following me all the way along Michigan Avenue. I saw my wife at 25, I stole her phone from her because my Insta360 died at the halfway point <laughs> and I had her phone all the way to the finish which was just so awesome. I was so thankful I was able to document it because I saw um, Steven's wife, Laura, she was shouting to me in the last bend going under Roosevelt. And then I cut the last corner on Columbus and sprinted. It was the only time I felt cramping in my legs and my calves the entire race, but I was just hauling as fast as I could. I dropped the camera low. And I just kept yelling, come on. And I crossed the finish line and um, it was just one of the coolest moments of my life, I'm gonna be honest. It was so cool to have three photographer friends right there, Sean um, and Joe and Nolis, all in a row take my photo as I'm like freaking out. Uh, it was just one of those like once in a lifetime kind of moments. And so I was just very, very thankful for friends and family that came out on the course. So if you're watching this, thank you so much for coming out and supporting me, all of you. That was just unbelievable to experience that. And um, thank you to all the photographers and people who filmed throughout to just help me document and remember and even share more robustly on, on you know, a breakdown like this and even the video that I made previously. I hope that that story is at least interesting to you or somewhat helpful if you're trying to go sub three. I'm gonna be making a lot of content the rest of this year into 2023 on how I am continuing to train, how I want to now break 255 and 250, and all the things that I'm doing to get me to that level, um, get me to that fitness, all the nutrition tips and tricks. And um, yeah, so if that's interesting to you, you can like, you could subscribe, you could follow along on this channel. Talk to the people around you, get to know, even if you're introverted. I'm very introverted myself, and I force myself to get out of my comfort zone in those scenarios to make those connections, and they end up being so helpful when it comes to racing and training. So yeah, go do that. As I said before, I'm running New York this year in November, and I'm gonna be documenting the entire race. So if that's interesting to you, you wanna see that video, make sure to follow along. Until the next time, Flowberg runs. I'll see you there. Oh, ho, 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 ho.
Look at me, champion number one. <laughs> number 1,583, I think. I think that was my place. 